My grandfather grew up on the tough streets of northern Philadelphia in the 1920s. And his father abandoned his family during the 1930 Great Depression. So at 12 years old, my grandfather worked three jobs. And he would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he would deliver the milk to the neighborhood, house by house. And when his work was done there, he'd walk about six blocks down to the bakery. And he'd help the baker uh, bake the goods for the day and, and get ready for the, for the store. And then after that, finally, he would, he would walk down to the newspaper stand, and he would sell newspapers before heading off to school. And he did that for the next four years. And when he graduated high school, he joined the military. And he was a gunner in World War II. And he flew over 30 missions over Berlin and France. And he won a lot of medals. And he, today, still to this day, he's a proud World War II veteran. And some of my best memories that I have in life was spent with my grandfather. I grew up in Loveland, Colorado, and my family would go up to Keystone, Colorado every weekend, and we would go skiing. And I'm the youngest of three kids, and so the rest of my family would go out and ski, and my mom and dad kind of pawned me off to my grandfather. And he would stick a, a yellow, big fluorescent helmet on me, and he'd pin a Superman cape to my back, <laughs> and we'd hit the slopes. And growing up, my, my mom was, was very conscious about health and food, and so we didn't have candy bars or sugar in our household. But my grandfather was the total opposite. <laughs> and he would pack his pockets full of little miniature-sized candy bars, and we'd get off the chairlift when I was three, four, and five years old, and he'd take these little miniature Snickers, and he'd throw them down the mountain. <laughs> and I would, I would ski as fast as I could down there to, to pick up these, the, these candy bars. <laughs> I made the U.S. ski team when I was 15 years old, and when I was 17 years old, I, I left the country for the first time. And I went to Tokyo, Japan, and I was so excited as, as a young kid to immerse myself in a new culture around people that grew up completely different than, than I did here in the Western world. And I remember when I was 17 years old, I was sitting on a bus in Tokyo, Japan, and it was a really crowded bus. And we stopped, and, and I saw an elderly woman start walking onto the bus. And as she started walking onto the bus, I saw everybody get out of their seats and offer a hand to her and help her onto the bus, clear a way for her, and made sure she was taken care of, and then everybody bowed to her. And I was really struck by this cultural difference. And... Throughout the next decade of skiing with the U.S. ski team, I saw similar events happen in other countries around the world, not just Asia, but in throughout Europe and Scandinavia and through South America. And every time I saw one of these events happen, I thought about my grandfather. I thought about my grandmother, who lived with us for the first 19 years of my life, who both are heroes to me today. And I thought how amazing it would be if our culture gave them the same respect that so many other countries give to the oldest population. And in 2008, all these questions in my mind around why just boiled over to the top. And so I started the Wish of a Lifetime Foundation. And the Wish of a Lifetime Foundation grants lifelong wishes to 80, 90, and 100-year-old people. And I had no idea when I started the organization if the wishes were going to be impactful, if they were going to be meaningful, or really what the wishes were going to be. And I met Nancy Tarpin a few blocks from where we all are today at the Volunteers of America Center. And I walked into a room and I saw Nancy and she didn't know who I was. Um, she didn't know what I was doing there. She just knew that I wanted to talk to her about life. And I talked to Nancy and she's just, she's one of the most kind people you could ever, met, ever meet. She, she's one of the, these seniors who would never ask for anything from anybody, very proud. And during the context of our conversation, I said, Nancy, if you could do anything in this world, what would it be? What would you do? And she said, my, my daughter, Lucille, was uh, diagnosed with terminal ovarian cancer seven years ago. 
And we talk on the phone every night. She lives in Claypool, Arizona. Um, but I live on a fixed income, and I, I don't have money to go see her. And it, it, it hurts me because I, I, I'm hearing in her voice recently that it, it, it's getting worse. And it tears my heart out to know that I'm not going to be able to say goodbye. I want you to imagine in your life that your son or daughter was dying and you didn't have the resources to see them to say goodbye. That was the reality for Nancy. And Nancy and I went to Claypool, Arizona, and she spent three amazing, amazing days with, with uh, Lucille. And it changed her life, and it had a profound impact on mine. Bill Tiller taught us, gave us per- tremendous perspective into life, and that sometimes the simplest things in the world mean the most. He wrote into the organization in 2008, and he said, my wish of a lifetime is for a rug. Not a fancy rug, not an expensive rug. He just wanted a rug. And he continued to write, he said, I'm 86 years old, I live in Denver, Colorado, and I wake up in the morning and I have linoleum floor. And my feet, and and because of the diabetes that I have, my feet sting in the mornings, and I just think a rug next next to my bed would make a big difference. And we granted Bill his wish, and this is one of my favorite pictures that we've ever taken. (laughs) Because you can see the contagious smile on Bill's face. And this small $5 rug meant the world to him. But it wasn't just the rug, it was that somebody cared. We just recently granted our 400th wish to an amazing woman. That doesn't only symbolize how amazing she is, but how far we've all come in the last 80 years in our society. She, she, was, um, she was raised in the segregated South. And she remembers a time that she was um, eight years old and she boarded a train from, from New Jersey to North Carolina with her, with her grandmother. Her, both her parents were killed in car accidents when she was very young. And she got hungry when she was on the train, and, and she wanted to go get some food in the food cart inside the train. And so she asked her grandmother if she could go up to the food cart and get some train, and she said, no, no, we're not allowed up there. She said, what do you mean we're not allowed up there? And her grandmother said that uh, colors weren't allowed in the food cart. And she remembers pushing her face against the window and looking outside and saying, someday in my life I'm going to eat on a food cart. And 66 years later we were able to help her make her dream come true. And as she boarded the train, she got really emotional, and and our wish coordinator, Rachel, who's 24 years old, said it was one of the most amazing experiences of, of her life. Helene Dax was the first female air traffic controller in the United States. And... She, her wish was to fly again. She hadn't, been, she hadn't flown in, in 25 years. And this is a picture of her at work. <laughs> How about those outfits? <laughs> I think they should bring those back. <laughs> Maybe those guys up there wouldn't be falling asleep so much. <laughs> and her, we found Emily Warner. Um, who was also a female pioneer in aviation. Emily Warner was the first female commercial pilot in the United States, and she took her flying. Shirley loves Jeopardy. And Shirley, Shirley grew up blind, but it never, she never allowed that to get in the way of, of living a purpose-driven life. And she runs a, a game every Saturday in her Brookdale home, her senior living um, home in, in Florida, and she, in Braille, she writes down all the questions. And as Alex gives the answer, she runs her own game Saturday, and everybody comes around and, and just loves Shirley in, in her Brookdale home. And her lifelong wish was to meet Alex Trebek and to, to go out to L.A. and, uh, and watch Jeopardy. What was so cool about this, not only the fact that she met him, uh, she also asked him a, a, her, a question and stumped him. <laughs> she was really excited about that. 
Uh, and Virginia, um, she loves elephants, always has. I always thought that she, elephants were just the coolest animals, and, and she, she had never got a chance to see one um, and, and pet one. So we took her to the zoo, and she got to pet one. She got to talk to one. She got to wash one. She was just over the moon. But, you know, to our, um, to our surprise, she turned into one. <laughs> I love that picture. <laughs> and, you know, it turns out over the last four years, uh, we're not the only ones that really love the oldest generation. And this cause has become much, much larger than myself. And you know, there is a small army, and it's just building um, across the, the country, uh, embodying what we're doing and embracing it and helping us make a, make a big difference and, uh, and show a lot of growth. A lot of people ask me, you know, what are the most common wishes? Um, 44% of our, the people that are writing and asking for wishes are, are wanting some sort of lifelong dream to be fulfilled. 24% to celebrate passions. 18% to reconnect with, with a loved person uh, in their life. And 14% to, to veterans who want to commemorate some sort of service. And something happened in 2010 that, that really took us by surprise. We, we started showing up in, in eulogies from seniors that had lived sometimes 70, 80 years long. And their family felt so strongly about the impact that Wish of a Lifetime had on them that they would write things in the eulogies, like, in lieu of sending flowers, please send a donation to Wish of a Lifetime. And we couldn't really understand this. We're not saving lives, right? We're, we're just granting wishes. How could it possibly be having that, this type of effect? And so we wanted to study it. We wanted to understand it better, so we launched a wish impact study. And there's 91 wish recipients part of this study. It's an ongoing study, and the indicators that you see on the screen are sometimes one year post-wish. And the one that I would highlight here is physical health. I mean, how could physical health improve 80% in some seniors? And I guess if you believe that when the mind has purpose and meaning and you feel important, the body is healthier then it might make sense. Now, everybody knows we're, we're, we're dealing with a, a massive growth in the aging population. Not only because of the baby boomers, but because we're all living longer. In the average lifespan of a human born in 1900 uh, was almost half that of a human born today. There's 40 million Americans living in the United States over the age of 65. That number's gonna nearly double in the next 20 years. And if you're wondering what this looks like on a global scale, the countries shaded in green have a population of 20% or more over the age of 65. And right around the time that my generation is turning 65, uh, our world is going to look a lot different. There's 34,000 centarians living in the United States in 1990. That number has now doubled. The average lifespan of a female born in Japan today is nearly 87 years. Now, according to the Administration on Aging, in the United States, one in three older adults are living alone today. And if you separate out the genders and you just look male to female, if you look at females over the age of 75, nearly one in every two are living alone. And we see a lot of them. And we reach some of them at a point in their life where they feel like purpose has passed them by. They feel like society has discarded them and that they're not important anymore and their family members aren't engaged. And sometimes to those people, the simplest things in the world have such a profound impact. And what's so amazing about, I think, what we're doing is that every single person here can contribute to making a change. We already know, based off the data, what their wishes are. Everybody has somebody in their, in their family, a neighbor, a sister, a brother, a friend. And if you don't, go to hospice, go to a nursing care home, and say, can I have a moment of your time? And bring your kids along with you, too, so that they can understand the importance of this generation. And ask them, do they have lifelong dreams? Ask them if, if they have a passion in the, their life that they'd like to renew. Ask them if there's a reconnection in their life that they'd like to reconnect with. And ask them, maybe you know a veteran that would want to commemorate some of his service. And my best guess is that you're going to find that the answer is very simple and you can grant this wish on your own. But if you don't, 
And if you can't, we're certainly here to help. And in closing, I'll say this. I think it's okay that we put so much focus and funding and effort and support into kids. They're the future of our world. But it's not okay to turn a cold shoulder, a blind eye, to the oldest people in our society. The people that were on the boats of Pearl Harbor, the beaches of Normandy, fighting for our freedom, the people that paved our roads, that gave us life, and helped shape the world that we all love to live in today. And I would encourage all of you to do whatever you can in your life to say thank you to the oldest generation in our country. Thank you so much.